again. Okay, the good morning, everyone. The Committee on Public Safety, Judiciary, and Homeland Security is officially called to order. Madam Clerk. Commissioner Bay from McCormick. Here. Commissioner Knizek. Here. Commissioner Dobb. Here. Commissioner Baydoon. Here. Commissioner Basham. Here. Commissioner Scott. Present. Chair Clark Woman. Here. You have a quorum present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, Madam Clerk. Again. Item number B. B. B, approval of the April 22nd, 2020 meeting minutes. So moved. So moved, Madam Chair. Okay, it was moved by Commissioner Bay June, supported by Commissioner Martha G. Scott. Uh, are there questions on the motion? Hearing not, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The motion carries. Madam Clerk. <clears throat> C O business, there is none. Okay. Item D1 under new business discussion with the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management about the actions it's taking regarding the COVID 19 pandemic. Okay. Uh, we, at, at our last committee meeting, we decided that um, this, because of the fact that this is a, a constantly moving target. We really need to be updated on a regular basis because we're looking at, at our security. So uh, I've asked, uh, we were supposed to have a couple action items, but uh, at the last minute they were pulled because there was, they still had some more work to do on those action items. So, but we decided to move on and to get an update on what's going on in our uh, in, in our departments. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that we, we're having the, which one are we having first? The discussion um, with Department of Homeland. Um, okay, so the first one will be from the, the Sheriff's Office, and I think we have Chief Dunlap here. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are you ready? Yes, Chief. What you you want right, to bring? Good morning us again, everybody. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, you know, I thought okay. I'm like well, okay. first, but I'll be happy to go first. Uh, so today, uh, I'm happy to report that uh, a good number to play in the three digits of the day is 798. And you <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that? That is, that is our current jail population today. Seven hundred, seven hundred and ninety-eight mm -hmm. people. In our three, three jails, and we have over uh, 940 on tether electronic monitoring, and again, uh, that's a result of all of the work that has been put in by, you know, members of our staff, uh, from the sheriff down to the under sheriff, working along with a prosecutor uh, of. Uh, the criminal court were down to 798 today. In addition to that, I'm happy to report that as of this past Saturday, every inmate in the Wayne County Jail has been offered an opportunity to receive uh, both a COVID-19 test and an antibody test. And every one of the inmates, uh, a total of about 720 all except 34 have taken advantage of those test opportunities and the results are rolling in and uh, they're coming in slowly, uh, not as quick as we was hoping, but as of this morning, we had a total of uh, 40 positive confirmed out of I'm about sorry. 300. Sorry. You had a total of how many? 40. 40, 40 positives. Uh confirmed okay. out of, uh, uh, I believe, uh, about 475 results have been returned. And there's another 250, 275 that we're waiting for. And so if the trend continues as it is, uh, I believe uh, 
it's going to show us that the numbers are not as high as maybe we anticipated. And then another way that I like to look at that is certainly uh, it's an indication that we're doing some things right here in the sheriff's office uh, in terms of providing uh, not only personal protection equipment to our staff, thanks to uh, Colonel Sturdivant and his team at Homeland Security, but also to the inmates. Uh, I believe the equipment that we have been provided is helping us mitigate, reduce, and manage the spread of the COVID virus within our facility. And so, again, I'm very cautiously optimistic with my fingers crossed when the results come in. Uh, the number of positives uh, won't be an alarming number. I'm also happy to report that uh, we have had no increases in staff reporting positive results in the last five days. Wow. And so we have reached a number of uh, 206. And I believe, uh, although I can't give you the exact number right now today, I believe at least 95% uh, or better of our staff has been tested for the COVID-19 virus. And of that, we're at 206. Uh, and even the better news is uh, those employees are returning back to work. Uh, yesterday on our absentee report, only about 69 of those individuals that were absent were absent as a result of the COVID virus. And I'm happy to report that we have no information that any of our people are in the hospital dealing with this virus at this time. So, uh, other than uh, our test results, uh, the hard work is being done by the men and women in the jail, keeping this place clean and disinfected. Uh, uh, I have nothing additional to report. Um, Chief Dunlap, so yeah. you mentioned that, that there were 40 um, inmates that tested positive, correct? Yeah, and that number is probably going to go up slightly because, again, all of our results are not in. Yeah. And so the lab, is, you know, we hit them at one time over a period of three days with uh, uh, over 750 samples, both a swab and a serology blood sample. Mm -hmm. And so they agreed to get all of those processed for us. And as I indicated, the blood sample is to tell us whether or not the inmate uh, have the antibodies. So what happened, what do you do with the 40 that, that so, and I, I realize that all the tests are in, but as you get those tests and as you find out that they're testing positive, what do you do with those inmates? So the inmates that test positive uh, are all housed at uh, Jail Division 3. It's our Hamtramck Dickerson facility. And the reason for that is because we have the ability at Hamtramck Jail Division 3 to put them all in single cell rooms. And the reason I use the term cell rooms, if you're familiar with the two downtown jails, our cells are designed with bars, with gaps, open space between the bars. At Jail Division Three, uh, we have out of 14 housing units, eight of the housing units have single rooms with doors. And so we're able to isolate them to their own single room and not cross-contaminate the rest of the housing unit. And um, so these are separated right away. Well, yes, ma'am. Now, did they share a cell with someone else uh, during the time when they were found, found to be positive? So that, that's a very likely possibility. And even prior to us testing everyone, uh, mm -hmm. our jail health team, WellPath, had already started doing contact tracing. And as you know, contact tracing is uh, going, going back, identifying individuals that were housed or in the same space of those that uh, tested and reported positive to make sure that they're tested, monitored, and further evaluated. Okay, so just out of curiosity, uh, you mentioned that how many how many did you mention you have all together in the jail? How many inmates? Today, yes. Today, yes. Today, today, yes. Seven. 
798 people today. 798. And of that 798, uh, how many did you say agree to be tested? So when we tested, we were more at 820, uh, which was the last count on uh, Saturday, uh, this past Saturday. Okay. And all but 34 of those individuals uh, agreed to be tested. So, so that was my question, I guess, uh, just my own curiosity. Why wouldn't they want to be tested? Well, I think, uh, you know, for various reasons. Unfortunately, I can't tell you exactly why every inmate refused, but I do know that uh, some of those, the majority of those that refused to be tested were on the housing unit where that video that went viral about all the you know, false information about what was occurring in the jail. Oh. Some of you might have been made aware of that. And and those inmates are also a part of a, a, a lawsuit that is uh, been filed, I believe, uh, I think it was filed last week, Thursday. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting that one of the inmates that is one of the lead uh, plaintiffs in the case, uh, is someone who is in custody because uh, on top of what brought him to jail a year ago, uh, he was involved in a situation where uh, a fight occurred and another inmate died as a result of that fight. Mm. And so that is charged with manslaughter. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So, okay, I'm going to open that up for um, questions from my uh, colleagues. And for some reason, I don't have the, uh, I, I can't detect when people are, have their hands up. So you just have to uh, ask me. I raised so, my hand, uh, Madam Chair. And my, it's not showing up on my computer. Go ahead. Good Go morning. Ahead. Uh, yes. Good morning, Chief. How are you? Good to you, Commissioner. Uh, good to see you. I won't see you at... Uh, Sam's Club this weekend, will I? <laughs> no, no. I ran running into each other at the hardware Costco. Different locations while he was, uh, we were socially <laughs> distancing. He was shopping for his garden. Yes. Uh, I have a question. So we have 798 inmates uh, currently, a total. Do you have a breakdown of each uh, uh, jail, how many we have in each one? Yes, I do. At Jail Division 3 here in Hamtramck is uh, 150 people. Okay. At Jail Division 2, the oldest jail downtown, is uh, 386. Okay. And the, rest, and the rest is at Jail Division 1. So uh, that's yeah. 150, 386. Uh, so we got about 200. And 12 at Division okay. 1, is that right? Yeah, yeah the balance. And, it's 200 and... Uh, my, my question, mm -hmm. Chief, is, is part of uh, cutting... It's part of cutting costs during these challenging times right now. Uh, have you considered possibly temporarily consolidating the three sites, maybe uh, housing all uh, inmates, and I don't know, logistically, the, the different levels of, uh, of, uh, of inmates that you have. I don't know what the possibilities are of housing them in maybe in one building. This way you could uh, lessen the possibility of being exposed to COVID-19 and uh, we could, and I don't know how much money we would save uh, by, by doing something like this. So that's a very good question, Commissioner. Uh, I can tell you that I've been uh, the chief of jails and courts now since October of 2015. And uh, ever since that day, I've been looking for every opportunity possible to consolidate jail operations from three facilities to two. And ultimately with the building of the new jail, uh, three facilities to one. There are a lot of challenges associated with consolidating the jails. Uh, one, you indicated, uh, the COVID virus, which is the most uh, present challenge right now, and the ability to social distance. Certainly, if uh, 
We go down from three facilities to one. Uh, we significantly decrease the opportunity of social distancing individuals. And on top of that, you know, we have various security levels. Uh, some of our more violent uh, uh, people that's charged with our more violent offenses are housed at Jail Division Two uh, downtown. And, and that is because of one, their charge and classification and the design of the facility. On top of that, you know, we have some infrastructure challenges in terms of uh, getting uh, Jail Division One uh, up to speed where it can accommodate the additional, uh, uh, not only staffing, but inmates. However, I can tell you, I believe the sheriff and the county executive, Sheriff Napoleon and uh, Executive Evans are planning to meet sometime this week to uh, take a closer look at that themselves. So that is the situation right now. Uh, we've identified you know, all of the challenges and as much as I would like to just consolidate today, uh, there's a lot of things that have to be considered because you know, it's a very fluid process. You know, uh, there is a reaction to every action that we take and some of those reactions uh, could have negative consequences. As I indicated, further spreading the virus, uh, putting higher security level inmates all in one place, and, you know, the results that goes along with that. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Uh, can I uh, ask our members to mute your your your, I, I don't know if it's your background, but I do hear a background a noise in the, uh, and, and it's, it's a little distracting. So uh, it, it sounds like maybe children, <laughs> but, uh, but I do. Yeah. So if you can just kind of mute it, or if you're, if you've got sounds in your background, like children or animals, uh, it would be good if you until you are ready to talk. Okay, so uh, uh, is there anyone else that would like to ask a question of the chief? Uh, now my stuff pops up. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I have a question. This is okay. Commissioner Dobb. Okay, Commissioner Dobb, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so the, the inmates who are housed at, I think you said Division okay. Three, who, are, who have tested positive for COVID-19, um, if they are, they're being monitored by staff at WellPath, if it is determined that they need um, treatment at a hospital, what is the process? Where, where are they taken? Which hospital are they taken? And what is the process to take them to a hospital? And then what is the process for when um, it's determined that they're well enough to come back to the jail? So... Uh even prior to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have, you know, policies, directives uh, that, you know, clearly identify the process for when an inmate is sick to the point where they can't be cared for or treated in the jail. They are then conveyed uh, to one of the local hospitals. Uh, uh, the most frequent place is uh, Detroit Receiving Hospital. And in some cases, uh, there have been conveyances to, I believe, St. John's. But because of location, Detroit Receiving Hospital is the closest in proximity to our jails. And if an inmate gets sick, if um, an inmate... Excuse me, please. Uh, let me uh, just say that, uh, Madam Clerk, you, you might have to mute everyone. Mm -hmm. Other other than um, the, the speaker and okay. myself, uh, because we're still getting a lot of distraction, a lot of noise in the background. Okay. Go I'm ahead. Sorry, Keith. Okay, so if an inmate gets uh, sick to the point where uh, it's beyond the ability of our jail health staff to treat them, uh, that inmate will be conveyed to Detroit receiving a hospital by officers. So, cover themselves in the proper uh, PPE, personal protection equipment. Uh, 
and they will be monitored and guarded while at the hospital. Uh, and upon discharge, which is, which is a decision that will be made by the medical experts at the hospital, uh, that individual uh, could possibly be brought back to the jail and further treated, but only after a decision by the medical experts is made that that person is stable enough to be released. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you're welcome. Um, so you, uh, something occurred to me. Uh, what happens, I know we, we released, how many did you say we released on Tether? So today, uh, what did I call it? 940. 940. 940, yes. 940 on Tether? Yeah. Um, yeah. What is your process uh, for for them to continue being released? And uh, what happens when, well, I guess, uh, when and if this, this pandemic ever um, subsides, uh, will they still be allowed to be out on Tether? Yeah, so uh, we have 941 today. I apologize, I missed one of the numbers. Okay. And just to be clear, uh, I think we all know that the sheriff, Sheriff Napoleon, and the men and women under uh, the sheriff's office do not have the authority to release anyone. Anyone that is released and placed on tether in Wayne County is done so by the court with uh, often consultation of the uh, Wayne County prosecutor. Okay. Until that end, uh, prior to the pandemic, we were averaging about 640 people a day. Uh, Post-pandemic, through the work of uh, our prosecutor and the chief judge and members of our staff, uh, that number grew from uh, 640 to the 941 that we have today. And that is a you know a part of a process where every day they're looking at every inmate that comes into the custody of the Wayne County Sheriff's Office, and they're looking to see if there's someone who has pre-existing uh, health challenges. Uh, they're looking at their age. They're looking at the type of charge that they're charged with, and they're balancing that against uh, public safety. And then a determination is made whether or not that person uh, is better suited based on their health condition to be uh, monitored via tether in the community as opposed to in a closed space like here in jail. And so those decisions are being made every day uh, with the courts and the prosecutor. And that's how we got to the point where we are today. Um, do I have any more questions from members of the chief? Okay, hearing none, I thank you very much, Chief Dunlap, for uh, Ma Ma Oh, okay. This is, this is Felicia. Felicia, um, go ahead. Just, just to the point um, that uh, was made with regards to not all the inmates wanting to be tested and refusing testing, yes. that is a health issue. So as you all are aware, there has been an ongoing lawsuit since the 70s um, with regards to the jail inmates. And we meet with Judge Kenny, who oversees the consent order for the jail on a regular basis. Okay. This issue regarding the refusal of testing has been brought to his attention. Um, the attorneys who represent the inmates, the attorneys who represent the CEO, the sheriff, and myself on behalf of the commission, we're currently looking at a proposed amendment to the consent order, whereby Judge Kenny will require all inmates in custody to be tested, because again, it's a health and safety issue. Yes, it is. Uh, so I say that to say, and I think the chairwoman is still on the line, I'll be forwarding that uh, order over to you so that I could sign it on behalf of the commission. So there is some um, thing in the works to address that matter. Great, thank you. And Felicia, mm -hmm. thank, you. Felicia. thank you, Felicia. Okay, Felicia, I'm so, I'm so happy that you did clear that up because that's exactly where I was going. I just didn't want to press any further on that because I didn't know legally you know, if we should be pressing on that one. Uh, but I'm glad that you did uh, chime in. And I'm glad that you clarified that because my thought at that time was, you know, if a person refuses then uh, to be tested, 
And he's then putting the other inmates in jeopardy who yeah. have already been tested. Correct. So that is I, correct. And, and the one caveat to that is that um, the county will not be able to use their DNA for other purposes other mm -hmm. than testing. Um, uh, that's our certain understanding, that's a concern from, of some of the inmates. Okay. So to be limited to just for testing purposes. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you so much, Felicia. Okay. Um, uh, did I hear Madam uh, Chairperson have it, something to say? Oh, no. I was just thanking Felicia for making those comments, and I was looking forward to that document. She's going to forward over to me. Okay. All right. So, Thank you. Okay. So if, if, is there anyone else who would like to speak up, make a statement, or a question to the chief? Okay, then moving right along. Thank you for coming in once again. Uh, Chief, you have uh, certainly brought us very useful information because, you know, we get these questions from our constituents and on a regular basis. So it's very helpful to us to be able to uh, answer them. I learned a lot of stuff right here today that I did not know. So thank you so much. for Thank appearing. you. Okay, and I guess I... Um, that was item number two. What I overlooked was item number one, which is a report from the uh, Department of, of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And we will now take that at this time. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. This is uh, Ted Sturdivant. I'm the Director of Wayne County Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And uh, I'm going to uh, make just a few opening statements uh, give you an update, and then we'll open myself up to any questions that the committee members may have. Um, as I reported uh, at my last uh, appearance, um, our department is a small department, but we're doing big things. Uh, we're about seven people, um, but uh, we're working um, close to seven days a week since uh, the start of the disaster. Uh, which was right around uh, March 10th, March 12th. Uh, the primary responsibility of uh, Homeland Security is to support the health and human services side as from a federal standpoint, a state, and from a county standpoint, uh, health and human services or public health is the lead agency in slowing the spread of uh, COVID-19. One of our primary responsibilities is to provide uh, personal protection equipment to our first responders. And when I speak in terms of disasters or emergencies, I always like to speak in terms of phases. So our first phase uh, in this disaster of COVID-19 was providing personal protection equipment to our first responders who are identified as uh, police, fire, and uh, EMS. As we progress with our PPE supplies, uh, we now provide PPE for first responders, uh, funeral homes, long-term care facilities, as well as our Region 2 uh, South Health Coalition, which provides PPE for our local hospitals and medical uh, personnel. Uh, as I stated last time, we still uh, communicate with every jurisdiction in the county, including the city of Detroit, through their appointed emergency manager. We hold weekly conference calls on Thursday, and we have one scheduled for tomorrow, and we communicate with all of these emergency managers on a daily basis through uh, uh, the email system. So how do we procure PPE? How, how does uh, Homeland Security Emergency Management get this PPE? Well, we get some of it from the state of Michigan, which comes from FEMA through the State Emergency Operating Center. Uh, the county has also, through Aaron Wagner, our purchasing director, has purchased some PPE, and I'll speak in terms of that. And we have been successful in soliciting donations of PPE through companies such as Magna International, uh, General Motors, uh, Fiat Chrysler, DTE, McKesson Corporation, and J&B Medical. What is the system in which we operate and how do we procure this, uh, procure this uh, PPE? Well, 
the uh, Homeland Security on a daily basis, including Saturdays and Sundays, uh, monitor the Michigan Critical Information Management System. We enter data as well as requests in that system, and when we receive uh, uh, supplies from the state, we go back in and update that we've received those supplies. Uh, I work uh, specifically in cooperation with our executive office uh, to procure donations, and as a result of our department's um, very positive uh, relationship in the community, a lot of those donations have come to fruition. How much have we spent so far in the procurement of PPE? Um, my department, or Homeland Security, we are not charged uh, for PPE, which comes from the state of Michigan. However, uh, through purchasing and through um, the director of Aaron Wagner, we've uh, spent about $2 million in personal protection equipment. Uh, mainly, that is in 500,000 KN95 masks for Wayne County employees. Uh, that money, we, are, we would be eligible for reimbursement once we go to that phase in the disaster uh, to recoup those funds in which uh, we purchased. Uh, what is the method in which uh, the department uh, allocates this PPA out to uh, first responders? We took a survey of every uh, police department, fire department in the county, including the city of Detroit, and there are 6,656 first responders in the county. And if we take Detroit out of that mix, there's 4,086. We have conducted several push, pushes of equipment, and what I mean by that is our, our office has allocated equipment to all 43 jurisdictions uh, in the county through the local emergency manager, um, including Detroit. For example, uh, we uh, provided the city of Detroit with 50,000 N95 masks, and we gave that to the Homeland Security Emergency Management um, Office in Detroit, and they allocated it out to the fire, police, and uh, EMS. Uh, since we moved to another phase and as county employees are beginning to come back to work, uh, my office is now responsible for not only supplying PPE to those 43 different jurisdictions, but also to the Wayne County elected offices as well as to the CEO departments. Uh, we've distributed um, PPE to our Region 2 South Healthcare Coalition. Let me just talk about that healthcare coalition. A lot of times um, I get asked questions uh, from commissioners or from uh, the general public is do we uh, provide uh, PPE for hospitals? And the answer to that is yes. However, Region 2 South Healthcare Coalition is primarily responsible for providing that PPE, but we augment uh, Region 2 South uh, in their uh, equipment supplies. So that assists them in supplying uh, PPE for long-term care nursing facilities as well as hospitals. And for example, on just one of our push, we provided 25,000 KN95 masks to Region 2 South Healthcare, which is a state agency. Um, we've also provided uh, PPE to our local funeral homes as well. Um, we have not provided PPE to private businesses at this, at this particular point, and a lot of questions that I get asked are for testing um, for the COVID-19 or antibodies, and currently all testing is handled and their supplies and vaccinations is being handled by um, public health. Just for an example, I'm going to give you just a, a few uh, just stats, I mean, stats on donated supplies. Uh, General Motors has donated 85,400 surgical masks and 4,000 uh, face shields. DTE has provided 360,000 KN masks. McKesson Corporation has provided 104,000 N95 masks. And Magna International has provided about 9,000 face shields. What the department has currently issued to um, uh, uh, the first responders and to Region 2 South 
uh, and to our CEO in elected uh, uh, offices are approximately 300,000 face masks, 322,000 gloves, over 1,000 gallons of hand sanitizer uh, with 5,500 four-ounce bottles of hand sanitizer, about 9,000 gloves, 1,200 bio suits, and about 3,100 booties. Um, that concludes my uh, opening statements, and at this particular point, I will um, answer any questions that may come before me. Hey, so from our members, uh, are there any questions uh, for um, Mr. Sturdivant? Very, a very comprehensive report. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Commissioner. I testified also yesterday at Health and Human Services. That committee asked for a spreadsheet that, uh, uh, that indicates um, the amount and where we have allocated supply, uh, supplies. And uh, Madam Chair, if you would like that same spreadsheet, I would make that same spreadsheet available to your committee as well. That would be great, yes, because I was trying to take those numbers down. It was just too fast for me. So, <laughs> so that would be great. I understand. Uh, send it to our clerk, and the clerk will make sure that everyone gets a copy of that. Sure, I will uh, make sure that uh, becomes available um, to you as well. Okay, okay, that would be great. Any any more any more questions from or comments to uh, uh, Mr. Sturman? Anyone? Okay, hearing none. Uh, thank you so much for coming and giving us an update. We do appreciate this. This is very helpful to all of us, and we do appreciate. We also appreciate the great job that you're doing out there in making sure that 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 equipment is getting out and it's getting out to the right places. Um, so thank you so much for coming in and updating us. We'll look forward thank to you, seeing you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I work with a good team. Yeah, team effort. Do. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. Okay. Uh, moving on, moving right on. Item number three, I guess we would be getting a report from the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. And I think we have Tony uh, here today. Tony, are you here? What do we have here from the prosecutor's office. Madam Chair, this is Mark Hindelein from the prosecutor's office, and I know that Tony is on the line as well. Um, okay. Maybe working through the mute button. Okay. Oh, well then we need to unmute him. <laughs> <laughs> Please unmute Tony. What is it? I think Anyhow. he's the 590-5400 number. Okay, I'm going to look for his number now. One second. Is it mutilated? Okay. Okay, he's unmuted now. Okay. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, Tony. Okay. So we would like to, we're now open for a report from the prosecutor's office, and, um, and I imagine you're going to do that? Yes. I have been working with Aaron uh, Wagner, the procurement director, to uh, identify areas that are non-personnel areas where we can uh, project savings. Uh, we have come up with about a half a dozen of those areas, and we're looking into those right now where we're basically looking to uh, consolidate areas of procurement in order to uh, achieve a greater savings all the way across the board with the county. Uh, for instance, we have in the prosecutor's office currently uh, eight copiers whose contracts are going to come up uh, at the end of July. We're looking at a way to put all of those contracts under one master contract and achieve some uh, significant savings by doing that. Um, there are a number of areas that we're also looking into. We're trying to find as many areas within the prosecutor's office that are non-personnel that, that we can. The other is, uh, again, I have to take my hat off to the prosecutor herself, but we are chasing down grants. Um, one of the most important things that we are doing is 
looking at the ability to reimburse the county for items that are COVID-19 required. For instance, uh, we're looking at our case management system. If the case management system were in place, it would have been a much easier transition to uh, dealing remotely from COVID-19. Um, Tony, could are, I interrupt you for a moment? Uh, the prosecutor is yeah, on the yeah. line, but is muted. Um, oh, okay. We need to unmute the prosecutor. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. She might be calling user one. Okay, one second. Well, let me just say this. That's basically the areas that we've been okay, looking at. Okay, I'm here at now. For... Thank you. Go ahead, Tony. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Tony, finish up, and then I'll I'll give the report. I am. I'm pretty much done. That our primary concern right now is trying to find methods that the that we can put our efforts into the COVID-19 money in order to reimburse the county and the prosecutor's office for uh, the efforts that have been done during the pandemic. That's all I have. Would that be through the CARES program, Tony? Yes, that's exactly what we're going after. Okay, okay. Now, Madam Prosecutor, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, so I just have a couple of things to say. First, I want to uh, thank, uh, good morning, everybody. I want to thank uh, Tad for consistently giving our office our PPE materials. It's been very helpful. It was scant at first, but now uh, it's coming in at a good clip. I also want to thank the Sheriff's Department. It's been a pleasure to work with them on this. I don't know if pleasure is the right word, but it's been good working with them on this uh, jail issue. I gave a presentation, a nationwide presentation to um, major prosecutor's offices across the country and uh, other groups around the call as well. Um, we talked about the jail issue and we're by far the most organized and even everybody made that, that comment. And I think uh, that the chief is being, um, as usual, being modest. Uh, the jail population in, in March was uh, 1,388. It's been cut down to, like you heard, the 798. So that's an over 40% decrease. Uh, due to the efforts of this committee. So I just wanted you to know. And you're not seeing that anywhere else in the country. Um, I wanted to talk about um, the improvements made to the office, and we appreciate the county assistance. We now have, during most of our well-trafficked areas, we have uh, physical barriers, we have sneeze guards, and plexiglass up. Uh, and I, I don't know if people appreciate how grateful and how this completely raised morale oh, when I people had to come back to work. And so we still have a little bit more to go, but we are very appreciative of the county carpenters who worked with my uh, chief assistant in getting this done during the time of the uh, furlough, the paid furloughs, and that we are highly appreciative of that. Um, as Tony mentioned, we are doing a lot of work um, in conference with the county to um, make, do our part for the budget shortfalls. I want to talk about this somewhat very briefly. Um, I, we have areas, seven areas, within the CARES Act that we think that we will qualify for. We have sent this over and had meetings with, of course, the CFO, with Khalil Rahal, and with James Heath about whether these are going to qualify, and they are doing that work now. But if it does qualify, uh, it would be significant savings for my office. And I just want to briefly go through some of them. Um, we have drag racing that I don't know, as any of you know, has really been on the uptick with the executive orders. There are less people on the street, and people feel they can drag race through the streets of Detroit and other of our communities at sometimes at speeds of over 100 miles an hour on res not, not residential streets, but on streets like Seven Mile, uh, Woodward, um, some telegraph, some of the major streets in our county. And we're looking at one fatality already because of drag racing, and we've had about seven cases come in because of drag racing. And so wow. that, that's directly related to COVID, and so we are tracking our time when it comes to that, and we'll submit that to the Corporation Council. Another area that I mentioned last week, and I'm not going to dwell on it, domestic violence, family violence, child abuse is on the rise. And um, we are seeing just extra brutality when it comes to these cases. It's really kind of scary. I've been, seeing, I've been doing this work for over three decades, and I've never seen um, the brutality on some of these cases. We, I saw this past week uh, the worst child, child abuse case I've ever, ever seen. Wow. And it's just horrific. And so um, that's what's going on. It's been quite scary at this point. 
But what we're seeing is it relates to family violence. So we're tracking these cases as well, and we're going to track our time And because these are directly related to COVID and the stay-at-home orders. We have, as I said last week, we have abusers living with 24-7 the people they've abused uh, because of the, the, um, the uh, stay-at-home order. The third area is 400 Monroe. Uh, as you probably know, we um, have obtained space over there, but we had not moved. But in order, when the paid furloughs were over, in order to comply with the CDC guidelines, the county guidelines, and also with the safe distancing, social distancing, that we had, to, we had to move people out of the office. In our office, as some of you know, they have been over there, we have people triple booked in very small offices. And certainly people could not, um, because of our lack of space, but certainly people could not uh, exercise social distancing there. And so we moved several of our divisions, several of our, our people over to 400 Monroe uh, prematurely so we can cut down the people in the offices uh, to two or to one. We have rotating schedules, and we've been very diligent. My managers have been very diligent in plotting each, for each and every employee. If the people can't sit in their office without the six feet, we have to find other offices or places for them to go. So they come in on a rotating basis if they can work remotely. So that's what's been quite a challenge, but my hat's off to my managers and also to Mark Kindling, who, of course, with all that, comes IT changes and everything else that has to be done. So that can be directly related, directly related to COVID. We do that specifically so we have proper social distancing. Um, I'm not going to go through all the jail work that the chief talks about, but the hours and hours and hours, sometimes four hours a day on my part personally, doing this work. We're tracking that time as well because, again, this is directly brought on to, to COVID. So we've been trying to be very creative. We, of course, want to fall within the confines of the, of the, of the um, CARES Act. But as I think you know by now, my office always tends to be very creative in order to keep the budget cost down. Uh, our Conviction Integrity Unit, I'm running on a few more minutes, is another area where we had to escalate. Uh, as you know, there was a horrible breakout in the Macomb County Jail. We had some people there that we were – Kind of looking at exonerating or getting a new trial through our conviction integrity unit. We had to really put that on the fast track to get them out of the jail and work with the other agencies involved. Um, my, my department, my director of that unit, Val Newman, has also gotten from 50 to 75 phone calls from across the state and across the nation about people who know about our unit and who are, have loved ones that are in the jail seeking her guidance. So, so again, these are phone calls, and this is work that's done directly as a result of the COVID virus. The IT issues, uh, Mark is on the line. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. He has a meeting today with some county officials about that. So uh, there are markets, but the amount, the bottom line amount that you think we can save that may be eligible for the CARES Act. That might be eligible on uh, over $2 million, close to, close to three. You might be eligible for it. That's correct. Thank you. <laughs> So that so we've been working. I mean, Mark has worked day and night. He's literally been involved in almost every improvement we had to make, and, and we're not going to go through that today. I did some of that last week, or he did. And so again, all of that work is directly related to COVID, as the CARES Act states. And the last the last area that we want to submit our time, as far as the um, CARES Act is concerned, is um, the COVID case directly. Uh, as you may have read in the media, we've had several cases where we've had someone who was COVID positive go to our emergency rooms and physically have them in wind out, and I can never remember the second hospital, physically spit on the doctors and nurses and health personnel, say, announcing he has COVID, and we since learned he was COVID positive, saying that he hoped they would get it too. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we charged those cases. We have other cases in the office. I can't tell you how many we have. I think we have about maybe eight or ten of those cases that we are looking at um, directly as a result of COVID. People wanted to assault people and give them COVID because they have it. Some people have said they had it. They really didn't. That, that their intent was to infect someone else or make someone else think they were infecting them. Just things that we cannot wrap our brains around that people are doing right now because of this virus. And so the work that we're doing on those cases are obviously tied to COVID as well. So we think that we will have significant savings because of all that. That and, and, and that, in, in addition to uh, Mark's work in IT and with Tony's work, we have, we, I have several ideas about county-wide procurement process where we can save some money and perhaps get better return on some of these contracts that the whole county went to them instead of having individual departments have their own, some like printing and binding costs and other costs that, that Tony is working on, and so, some of the contracts that we think we can combine with other uh, departments. And then I'm, I'm working with one of my unions. I'm not, I'm not free to say uh, which one or what we're working on and hoping we can get together and also have some further cuts. 
as you know, we, we, we always do this anyway. We always look to ways to save money, and you know this because you know, I talk about it all the time when I come speak before you. And so we're really limited about what we can cut, but we still have dug deep, and we think that we have we will more than contribute to the county's um, um, desire to cut money from our budget. We can't cut people, um, and so I think these ways are going to be that we will be more than be able to meet um, and be a team player when it comes to cutting the budget because of the cost overruns, because of the, the, the deficit that has been projected. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about, um, and uh, in addition to everything I mentioned last time, and I'm free to take any questions, and you can ask Martha Tony any questions as well. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Okay, I do see one hand. I think that's Ray Basham, Commissioner Basham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Prosecutor Worthy, and, and your office for doing the things that you're doing in this critical time. But we are a nation of laws, and I appreciate the fact that you uh, – a couple of things that hit me is one is uh, uh, the person spitting on the uh, a nurse or, or a doctor at, uh, at the hospitals, uh, also the drag racing. Uh, we need to send a message that just because we're in a, a uh, world pandemic is no reason for us not to continue to enforce laws and tell people that, you know, uh, this radical behavior is not something that we'll accept as a state and as a county. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments uh, for, the pro for the prosecutor, for members? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Prosecutor. I, I, let's see. Let's unmute everyone, first of all, before we do that. Let me, then, let, now, let me ask again. Is, is there any other member who would like to speak on this, to the prosecutor uh, at this time? Okay. All right. Then we'll move right along. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for coming for coming in. Thank you for allowing us uh, to hear your recent uh, your report. Anytime, I'm, I'm at your service, so anytime you want to hear from me, we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, uh, uh, Madam Clerk. These such other matters as may be properly submitted. I'm sorry, Madam Clerk, what did you say? Such other matters as may be properly submitted before the committee. Okay. Uh, I have not been informed of any other um, items, so we will move on to the next item. Public comments. Um, are there any other comments from members? Okay, now, are there any comments from the public? Do we have anyone from the public that's on the line? That would like to make a comment. Do we have anyone from the public who's on the line who would like to make a comment on the issues that we've discussed here today? And the lines are open. Am I correct? Everyone's unmuted? Yes. Okay. So I take it that there's no one else who would like to make a comment. Last, last call. Anyone else? Would like to make a comment from the community or from our members. Hearing none. Item number G. Adjournment. So, so moved. moved, Madam Chair. Moved by Commissioner Martha G. Scott and supported by Commissioner Basham. The meeting is adjourned. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The meeting.